one. This talk today is called Bad Bucks, No Drugs. So go ahead and welcome Dr. Shaw. Okay, thank you. So all the way back to very simple, and I, I don't wish to insult anyone's intelligence, but you start low and build. And so I'm here to talk about germs, and so a whole bunch of microscopic things that we can't see. Um, and so tiny little things, you look under microscopes, they are all over human beings. We are so gross. We are covered in these things, right? Our mouths, you, you would rather be bit by a dog than a human being, because it's just obnoxious. And hands, dear God, I mean, I have a toddler, but grown-ups are just about as bad. These things just spread horrible disease. So. Uh, humans are just a terrible reservoir. And so there are a bunch of different kinds of these germs, right? Four major kinds, so viruses, and then fungi, mold, parasites, and then the ones that occupy pretty much all of my time, bacteria. And so this is what I'm going to be talking about. It's a bunch of bacteria. And so uh, to give you a context of why I do this, right? Because every time you listen to someone speak, you kind of should ask yourself, why the hell should I listen to them speak? Are they an idiot? And so why I do this. And so this is a, a normal human femur, right? That's what femur looks like when it's growing. And this bottom picture here is a diseased femur where the cap slips off the bone. And so this happens in teenage boys. It's kind of a genetic condition. It's what happened to me. And so when I was 13, I had not just one, but three pins put in my hip to put the cap back and right. And so doing what I do now, I've talked to a lot of infectious disease doctors, and they'll tell you that pretty much everything that goes into the human body is contaminated. And so that was me, two of my three pins had um, Staph aureus on them, um, the bug I now work on. They formed a biofilm, and so for five years I was living with a staph infection. And so I've been in and around kind of hospitals and bugs and drugs for, since I was a teenager. So this stuff to me is not just an idle curiosity, it's kind of personal. So I do this because I, I genuinely care about it. And so, that quickly? Am I that predictable? Okay. I'm curious now. Oh, never mind, all right. So to put things in context, this is the size, this is all to scale this slide. This is a human skin cell. This next one is a human blood cell, and that tiny little thing down there is a staph cell. A million times smaller than our own cells, right? Something a million times smaller than our own cells can destroy people. How can something so small and theoretically simplistic cause so much damage to, you know, we think we're smart, we have two legs and we walk around and we have a brain, but these things are tiny and they cause huge problems. You know, the, the real secret, or the kind of dirty secret, is that we're actually more bacteria than we are human beings. There are 10 to the 15 human cells inside here, and all of you, but there are 10 to the 16 bacteria. So you are 10 times more bacterial cells than you are human cells. So when I kind of find myself talking about as if I'm a bacteria, it's kind of almost true. So 10 times more bacteria. So I kind of like to think about this in a bacterial-centric megalomania way. Like, so bacteria showed up on this planet about 3.8 billion years ago. We showed up about 200,000 years ago, so essentially yesterday. So they've been on this planet by themselves, independently evolving for almost 4 billion years. So everything that we think we can do, how smart we are and everything we think we know, we're completely useless compared to these things because they've seen it all before. 4 billion years of independent evolution is going to teach you an awful lot of things. So we've been dealing with human infectious disease for an awful long time, and not just since the 1500s, but this is a picture that depicts the Black Death, right? Wiped out half of Europe in the Middle Ages. Um, Yersinia pestis, now a, pro a problem we don't have anymore, but infectious disease has been causing problems as mankind's society has been evolving. In context today, the kind of problems we have, we're talking, and these numbers are probably tenfold underrepresented, because many of us have had a bacterial infection that we don't report, and so these are only the reported numbers. Every year, 2 million people get a, a drug-resistant bacterial infection. So to put that into context, that's like the entire city of Houston every year getting a bacterial infection, or the state of Nebraska. So if maybe we could just move all the infected people to Nebraska, and we could probably just solve the problem there. I, I don't mind the Midwest. I've been there more than a foreigner should, maybe. But, um, so that's the numbers of infections. And so what about the numbers of deaths? And so again, think about these as at least tenfold underrepresented. 100,000 deaths from drug-resistant bacterial infections every year. And to put that into context, that's West Palm Beach dying every year from a drug-resistant bacterial infection. In the short time that Marty and I will be talking to you tonight, 50 people in this country are going to die from a drug-resistant bacterial infection. That might not sound like a lot, but those are huge numbers compared to most other things. Now, if one looks at disease projections, not just for drug-resistant bacteria, but for disease as a whole, by 2050, it's projected that we'll have something like 10 million antimicrobial resistant, AMR, infections. You can take heart disease and diabetes from that, put it together, and it's still not as much as drug-resistant bacterial infections, right? So 
all of us that work on disease try to say our disease is more important than everyone else's. And I'm certainly not marginalizing cancer and diabetes because they're horrific things that touch many lives. But drug-resistant bacterial infections are kind of talked about a lot less, but potentially much more damaging. And so of those 100,000 deaths every year, you're talking maybe 25,000 of them are from bugs where there are just no drugs left. Completely needless infections where we have no more antibiotics. And it's, it's got, it was at the point which just in the 19, was it 1961 or 1967? Secretary General, uh, uh, the, the health US Secretary General said essentially close the book on infectious disease. We got this beat, right? Because the 1960s was when we had the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery. And a couple years later, it all went to hell. And so we're kind of overly kind of, it's hubris and over kind of confidence and arrogance that we would suggest this, but it's that four billion years of independent evolution. These things know what they're doing. And so Mercer, I'll tell you an awful lot about, but then I'll get to some of its friends because these are what we do in my lab. And so as I said, I won't really tell you what we do. Or I'll tell you kind of more broad, broad general terms. So nature will always find a way, and that's the simple question. Do you want to die? Antibiotic treatment, the bug says no, and so it finds a way. So here's superbug, here's Mercer. He's got a little cape on, and so it's the poster child for being a superbug, and so most people are relatively unimpressed, and then I say, well, he does this, and then he does this too. <laughs> no one else can do that, and so I conclude the bug is super. So this bacteria, you can find it everywhere. It's um, ubiquitous in nature. It's the whole planet wide. And so you can find it in soil, you can find it in water, you can find it in sewage, which infects our beaches here in Florida, and so it's a major problem. You can find it in the air. It's truly everywhere, and you can most occasionally find it in my brother too. And so it's, it's everywhere, and by my brother, I really mean human beings, right? And so one in three of us carry this bacterium in our nose. And so I don't know how many people are in this room, but a third of you, I think I'm one of them, have Staph aureus in your nose right now, which is in your nose and your anterior nares. You take into account other body parts, skin and things like that, maybe one in two, and so there's a lot of Staph aureus in this room right now. And so if one takes into account global infectious disease, I get it, you know, the problems are things like malaria, the, the TB, the cholera, um, HIV, and so these are the global problems. But in a developed country such as this, we tend to create new problems that are our own problems. And so if for one moment we take the typical American-centric view of the world and just pretend it doesn't exist and we just delete it, um, <laughs> and I'm, a foreign, I'm an American citizen too now, so, and you'll notice I actually just lopped off Tampa. <laughs> I it wasn't, wasn't about to go back and fix it, so. And I made that five years ago, I still haven't fixed it. So, but if you look at this country, um, just so from an infectious disease perspective, the leading cause of infectious disease and death in this country is from MRSA. And so those numbers that I gave you, 2 million with 100,000 deaths, which are probably tenfold underrepresented, MRSA is a majority of those numbers. This is the gory pictures moment, right? So I give you the disclaimer, there are gory pictures. And so sometimes I'll give a talk and say, do you want the pictures or not? And everyone yeah, wants the pictures. Yeah. Always want the pictures. Now, when I give the pictures to students, nothing. It's like they're dead inside. I don't know. No response. I think it's just when you're young, it's not that scary. But. So I'll give you a sense of the infection. So this bacteria can cause infections in more ecological niches in the human body than any other bug. And so it starts out with a basic skin infection. And so here we have a wound in an eye, but pretty much any kind of boil and abscess on the body ruptures and spews pus and all kinds of other stuff. It causes impetigus uh, cellulitis. Scott's skin syndrome is um, it's the action of a single toxin. And so what it does is it cleaves one protein in the human skin and it causes third degree burns. And so back in the 60s, um, children were being taken away from their parents because um, the authorities were saying, well, you poured boiling water on your child, but actually it was just a bacterial infection that makes it look like scalded skin. Necrotizing fasciitis is um, pretty obnoxious too. And so this picture is only the second worst picture of necrotizing fasciitis I've ever seen. The worst one I've seen is someone with half their face missing, you know, and that's so it's necrosis and death of the fascia and that stuff just doesn't come back. And so it's a leading cause of this, particularly in IV drug users. Once it's moved from the skin, which is our largest organ, it gets into the blood and from there it can go to everywhere in the body. And so once it does that, it can pick anywhere it wants in the body and cause an infection. So it can go to the brain. It can cause meningitis, which is unpleasant, but it can also cause abscesses, right? So it loves to go to organs, hide in the organs, build these huge densities of infection and then rupture. So if you've got an abscess in the thought center of the brain and it ruptures, then that stuff doesn't come back. And this is, this is becoming more and more common. So we can go to the heart. And so in the heart, it's going to cause something called endocarditis. And it's going to form a biofilm on a heart valve. It's going to eat the heart valve. You have a heart attack and you die. And so this is a major problem that's often underreported and called a heart attack. And when I first moved to USF, I met a student who just survived uh, an endo a Mercer endocarditis infection. And you don't see those people walking around very often. It was incredible. 
So we'll go to the lungs, and so the lungs basic pneumonia is not fun, but what I'm showing here is necrotizing pneumonia. So there's black tissue I'm showing right here, and so that's necrosis, creeping necrosis and death of the, the lung tissue. That'll kill you in 36 hours, which is anthrax quick at killing. And so this thing has gone from what used to be a relatively benign bug to killing people in rapid time. We'll go to your bones and cause osteomyelitis. Loves to eat the bones, anywhere in the bones. Leading reason that diabetic patients lose limbs they get the neuromyopathy and then they lose feeling, they get damaged, they get wounds, staph infection, osteomyelitis. It's a very unfortunate situation, but a lot of amputations because of staph. We'll then go to your bones, right? Bones age as we get there and we get arthritis. Well, it'll get into there and eat the synovial tissue and the cartilage and cause septic arthritis and such. It's completely unpleasant. Uh, that's done with the pictures. Um, like eighth leading cause of food poisoning, a billion dollars a year, and then toxic shock syndrome too, which thankfully is somewhat under control, although it may be potentially creeping back. So why can it do all these different things in the human body and cause so much devastation? And I kind of liken it to this, like all these different things I'm showing here, what they are is really just cannonballs. The bacteria has got a bunch of different weapons that it can use to attack the human body. Not just one as some bacteria have, but it's got a ton of them. And so it's got a ton of these different attack mechanisms that it uses to attack the human body and that causes these problems. Well then you may say, well it doesn't matter, right? Because we've got antibiotics and unfortunately, I mean, I'm giving this talk because we don't. And so this uh, kind of the scientist, it's the antibiotics bedtime story. So this is Anne Sheaf Miller here with Sir Alexander Fleming who discovered penicillin. And so in 1942, Anne Sheaf Miller, Salisbury, Connecticut was hours from death with a strep infection. She's in a hospital, she's dying, they can do nothing for her. And they say, look, we've got this wonder thing lying around, they call penicillin. And for compassionate reasons, like sure, it's not approved, but give it to us, see what happens. She's cured within like 24 hours, she's up around and walking and she lived to a ripe old age to be 80 plus and so, this really changed things. Um, 1944 is the first recorded resistance to an antibiotic. So two years afterwards, but those of us who work in science, it takes about a year to publish a paper. A year after the introduction of penicillin for a strep infection, Staph aureus had already beaten it. And so this became kind of the mantra of what's happened in my world. This is a slide a, a grad student of mine made several years ago. On the top, a drug is introduced. On the bottom, resistance occurs. With some exceptions, the theme is the same, one year. It takes about a year for the bug to beat the drug, and that's a huge problem. Some of them up here we don't see resistance quite so quick to, often because we don't use them for staph infections. Vancomycin we held off for the longest time because it was the only thing we had left, but even that fell along the wayside, and so every time the bugs will beat the drug. This is a slide I stole from uh, Steve Projan, who used to be head of drug discovery at Wyeth. Um, he gave a talk several years using this, and so it was all the dr drug discovery companies working on antibiotics about 15, 20 years ago. And then just a few short years later, the number of companies working on antibiotics, and they, they stopped doing it, so pharma just got out of the game. This was almost kind of getting better. There was a company called Cubist working in the Northeast who really got back into antibiotics, and I'll talk about why pharma got away from it in a minute, but Cubist were really good. They worked with a lot of people, developed some really cool drugs, and then last year they got bought by, bought by Merck, who's kind of an uber pharma company, and then within about two months, Merck had shut down all R&D. They just bought the patent portfolio and said, you don't develop drugs anymore. We just want the patent portfolio. And so Cubist were kind of turning a corner for us and then it all just kind of fell apart again. And my, my group were actually working with some Cubists on some pretty cool things. And so why, right? Why did pharma get out of this? And I don't want this to be a, a soapbox against big business because pharma companies have to make money. They're a profit-making entity and I don't begrudge them that. But in every new drug, and this number is probably an, a, a, a small number now, it might be more like a billion, that's how much money they need to make in the first year of the introduction of a new drug to pay back all the R&D, the marketing, FDA approvals, shareholders, all those kind of things. And so if the bacteria are going to take 12 months to beat the drug, you're not going to get your half billion dollars. And so what you've got is a lack of profit model in antibiotic development. Pharma wants to sell you a statin for 30 years as a repeat customer, not an antibiotic for a week that might not work. And so we just have this issue where it doesn't make sense to ask for profit for something that we need but we can't make profit from. So this is what happened. Pharma just got completely out of the game. They, they kind of ran off and everyone in academia went, where did you go? Because we can't do clinical trials without pharma. We, as academics, are incapable of doing so. We need pharma around. If one looks at what I'm talking about in terms of pharma getting out of the game for drug discovery, this is the number of antibiotics approved over time from the 80s to the, uh, the kind of just about five years ago. You can see that that number goes down. At the same time, and this is not it's small, it's not intended to be seen, but this is the different classes of antibiotics we've discovered from the 30s until about the mid 80s. We picked up nothing since about 1990. So overlay those two things, right? We stopped discovering in like the late 80s, 
the numbers start going down. This completely correlates. And so a lack of investment in the development of these things means we don't have any drugs. At the same time, this graph over here shows increasing incidences of drug resistance in staph and pseudomonas alongside that decreasing of new approval of antibiotics. And you don't need me to tell you those lines go in the wrong direction if we want to kind of stick around. So in terms of treatments then, well, okay, if we don't have antibiotics, what about vaccines? And so talking about MRSA for a minute, what about a MRSA vaccine? Wouldn't that be great? So this is a list of companies, and it's a few years old now, that have tried to make a staph vaccine, and every single one of them's lost its shirt, because what's important for a meningitis vaccine is not important for an endocarditis, or a septic arthritis, or a food poisoning, or a toxic shock syndrome, so there's no one size fits all to stop this bug. And so we've got a bug that causes more infections than anyone else, causes I mean, more niches than anyone else, is drug resistant and you can't make a vaccine. So we used to think of MRSA as a hospital problem and the old adage is we're full of sick people and healthy bacteria inside hospitals. But about 15 years ago, this became a community problem. And so in the community, we started seeing young healthy people, such as people in this room, developing severe invasive staph infections and dying. It used to be you were in a hospital, you were old, you were sick, immunocompromised, you had an infection. Now young healthy people were getting them. And so what happened was, if this little guy looks bad, this guy is worse, and so this is what we call community-associated MRSA. It just got crazy aggressive. It started making more toxins, being a bad pathogen because it was trying to kill the host. And so we've had this epidemiological shift in kind of invasive infections and virulence of staph aureus, and we still don't really know why, but that's what's causing all these, these deaths. And those community strains are displacing the old hospital strains and, and kind of making them their way into the hospital. And so now you've got really aggressive bugs getting into hospitals where there are sick people, and it's causing devastation. So what this means is, and as I said, bad bugs, no drugs is not my title. The infectious disease types of America kind of came up with this idea that we've got a problem, and this problem is not necessarily that new, but it's not getting fixed. And so they, they kind of came up with this idea 10 by 20, and this was, they started this in 2010. They wanted 10 new drugs by 2020 approved for use in the clinic. It's not going to happen. It never was. But it's a noble idea. So they also coined this thing called the escape pathogens, E-S-K-A-P-E. And so... This is staff's friends, and so the escape pathogens are the top six bugs, E, S, K, A, P, E, different bacteria. And to me now, the word escape has a K in it. If it has a C, it looks weird to me. And so these are the top six bugs that cause two-thirds of all hospital-acquired infections. And so everything I just told you about staff, it's got buddies and they're just as bad. And so there's staff, it's the S of escape. Um, to introduce you to a couple of its friends, Cladneumoniae and Enterobacter cloaceae, we call those CREs, and the CDC has issued a uh, a suggestion that these are the nightmare bacteria. So they may not kill as many people as Staph aureus, but dear God, there's almost nothing you can use to treat them. Acinetobacter bomonii is better known as Arachibacter, and so this thing was a huge problem with the troops in the Middle East after the conflicts, and so those problems came back to the US, and now Acinetobacter infections are a huge issue in US hospitals. And then Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this guy is incredible. I mean, if I talk about these bugs being really hard to treat, Pseudomonas is almost impossible to treat. We work to develop drugs in my lab and we never get anything against Pseudomonas. So why do we have this problem, right? So I've told you the, the kind of the idea of the problem, but then there's a question of why. If you understand the problem, can you fix it? And so just like it says here, part of it's lack of research, part of it's commitment on uh, healthcare providers, researchers, um, funding bodies, surveillance and the epidemiology, irrational drug use is a huge issue and no infection control. There are many different things that you can point to, but to look at a few of them. Uh, this is the prescription of antibiotics per capita. So this is normalized for, for um, population, and so it's not like small countries are going to come out worse in here. We're about fourth for prescription of antibiotics. Um, just to show you, this is Greece, the most over-prescription of antibiotics in the entire world, and this is a map of Europe, and Greece has the worst problem for MRSA and other drug-resistant bacterial infections. So there's a correlation between how many antibiotics you give out and how many drug-resistant infections you get. This is another issue, misuse. Um, it's quite common, particularly for those people who are not into even just bacteriology, to get a cold or a sniffle and immediately want to go to a, a hospital or the clinic and try and get some treatment. You know, most things that infect us are viruses, and it's just going to resolve itself. Antibiotics don't work. But I've talked to clinicians, and they'll tell you that it's 3 in the morning. There's a 19-year-old mother with a 3-month-old baby. She's, the baby's been crying for a week, and she thinks the baby's going to die, and so he'll just give them drugs because it makes her feel better. And so. There's a, there's a sense here amongst clinicians of being helpless, but they're adding to the problem, but they can't really do much else. And so there's this misuse, and unfortunately, too many people request antibiotics when they just don't need them. This is some data that is some good, some bad. Um, so it's from a few years ago, but it's looking at um, 
children, children infections, a respiratory disease. So this is showing a 24% decrease in the unnecessary prescription for children. But in the same time, the majority of antibiotics prescribed to grown-ups were still unnecessary. Viral infections, 58% of all antibiotics were being prescribed for things where you just didn't need them in adults. And so we kind of have, can make choices that children can't. And so people need to think about, do I really need to go and get an antibiotic or is this just a sniffle? This is kind of a boring slide, but I love this slide because it just shows the cyclical nature of the problem. You can start anywhere on this, but if we increase the amount of antibiotics we use, we get more increase in resistant strains. Because we have increase in resistant strains, drugs simply don't work anymore, so we need more antibiotics. More antibiotics leads to increase in people going to hospital because the drugs don't work anymore. This depletes the resources of the hospital, limiting our treatments, increasing mortality, so we prescribe more antibiotics, and so the cycle goes. It's a vicious cycle we've got ourselves into, and it's hard to get off the merry-go-round, the carousel. This is the single biggest thing you can do to stop this problem. 75% of all antibiotics prescribed in this country go to the agricultural industry. And so pharma don't want this to stop because 75% of their profits go away immediately. So you go to Publix and you see the green-wise meat, not the regular meat, and you think, I'm not paying more money for that. There's no difference. The green-wise meat is not raised with antibiotics. So they give antibiotics to these things to stop to animals, to stop them getting infections, to take away the normal flora, to increase um, uh, yield of meat, but what you do is you breed antibiotic resistant bacteria inside um, poultry and cows and stuff and then we eat them, mis contamination, mishandling of meat and so the ag industry is our biggest problem in terms of if we can shut that down it's not going to solve the problem but it's going to help the problem because we can't control it with that massive rampant over prescription. Couple quotes, and I know they make for boring things, but at least suggest that politicians now are beginning to listen. So this is from my own country, the Chief Medical Officer Sal uh, Sally Davis from a few years ago saying, drug resistant bugs are essentially about as bad as a natural disaster or terrorism. And that might seem like kind of scaremongering, but it's real. I mean, this could be the problem. Um, this is um, from the CDC just from a few years ago. If we're not careful when we go to the medicine cabinet, there could be nothing there. Uh, and if we don't do something now, we're gonna get back to a time where we had no drugs. And so we do find ourselves faced with a prospect of the post-antibiotic era, the time after which there are no antibiotics. The pre is we didn't have them, post we don't have them anymore because we, we, we kind of lost the privilege. I can tell you that experts in the field suggest that we may only be 10 years away from having a post-antibiotic era. So it's not like that this could be 50 years from now, it could just be 10 years from now. If we get there, 80% of invasive staph infections will kill you. Only 20% will resolve by themselves. And so post-antibiotic era will be guaranteed to lead to increased mortality. This is from Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization a few years ago. And this, to me, is the best quote. Essentially, if we reach the post-antibiotic era, modern medicine as we know it is over. You can think of things like a scratch knee, strep throat, forget chemotherapy, forget basic surgeries, forget transplants. Um, when you go to the dentist, they give you antibiotic prophylactically because they make you bleed up there. You know, if we get to that point, pretty much everything else doesn't matter because the bugs are gonna get you first. And so we're in a biological arms race. This is a real thing and it's happening right now. And this shows us almost close to the bugs, but that's completely wrong. You know, they're over the hill and down the other side and we're kind of wheezing up the first part of the hill. We're so far behind them because of that discovery void of 20 or 30 years. And so again, we get back to this. Huge, big human cell, million times smaller, simple, easy, no problem, right? There's an 800-pound gorilla in the room, and it's not us. It's the bugs that one-third of us are carrying around right now. So the, the, the World Health Organization has labeled growing crisis of infectious disease a problem, but really antibiotic resistance is one of the top three problems that we face in this coming century. And so there are enough people pointing to the fact that this is a problem. How do we fix it? We kind of got ourselves into a situation where it's not really clear and I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, we have to find a solution and it ain't gonna be easy. We've done this for too long. We've just stuck our fingers in here and said, la la la, I'm not listening. It's not worked. We have to do something different. We have to work together because it's a global crisis. That 50, was that 10 million antimicrobial resistant infections? It's, it's a global problem. Developing countries are really contributing to that too now. And so, the, a large issue is there's no advocacy, right? So there's huge amounts of foundations for, for heart disease and for cancer and diabetes. And again, at no point am I saying that they aren't big problems because they're horrible problems that affect many people. But you get a bacterial infection, you get over it, you don't. There's no advocacy for it. There's no kind of voice in the media. And, and it, this isn't gonna, I don't want it to sound like it does, but we often say that it's gonna take a Kardashian to get a Mercer infection for people to listen. I'm not saying they should get one, but if they did, it might help. 
right? People would start to listen when it reaches the media. Politicians have to get involved, and I showed you a couple of quotes, and our own president has finally kind of begun to get on the board too, um, that there's a problem and that we need to think about this. We need to get pharma back in the game. It might sound like I was bashing pharma to get rid of them, but we need them. We as academics can't do this alone. Small biotechs can't do it alone. We need pharma to come in and run these trials for us. Uh, academia, so that's my university, that's where my lab works. Um, it's kind of been left to us to do the discovery part that pharma doesn't want to pay for. We have to do our part to partner with biotech, partner with pharma. Um, it's going to be a collective thing. No one group by themselves can do it um, because you cannot move things unless you work in a group in a chain together. And so if we don't kind of begin to put all this together, the solution is going to be difficult and we very much might find that it could be the end. I'm done. Thank <laughs> you.